My interest peaked in wrestling. I watched it all the time. Watched it till my eyeballs bled. Was the summer of 89. I want to thank Brian Adams for writing that song for his favorite wrestling podcast, Stick to Wrestling. This is the only Wicked Good podcast out there, only good, Wicked Good Wrestling podcast. Give us 60 minutes and we'll give you a little slice of heaven. I want to bring on my convivial co-host, Mr. Sean Goodwin. Sean, what about our Facebook page? A bunch of nicer folks you'll never meet. Yeah. I am I mean, still waiting for our first douchebag moment, and it's been over a year. I, I am convinced the internet's broken. No, nope, absolutely. It's like the, the haven. If you are sick of fighting and arguing with people, come over and see us. We don't yeah, fight. Really. We don't argue. We talk wrestling. Sometimes it's a, dis- a disagreement about, you know, Bruiser Brody or whatever. Like, for example, there was this whole thing about my criticism of Tony Schiavone. Uh, yeah, that was yeah. bad, man. You shouldn't have done that. I know, my I did not know, but hey, God bless Tony. Tony has this big fan base <laughs> that I did not know about. So you know, I'm good for Tony, but you know, they're passionate, but they're always you know good guys, and you know, never yeah, as you said, no douchebaggery. I, I remember when when Shivani went to the WWF in early 89, I felt like I was the only one who, who was like, you know, I don't think he's that bad, but I don't think he's that good either. He's he's more of a TV announcer than a wrestling announcer. I mean, he was fine when it was, you know, stay tuned, fans, we'll be right back after this. But, like, when it came to calling a match, I didn't like the guy at all. If he just called the match, he was fine. My problem is when he went over the top with it, he started doing, like, the David Crockett-isms when he yeah, got you don't to. don't want to do That's those. It. And Thomas brought up a good point that, you know, it may have been that, that that's what Vince was telling him to do, was telling him to push it, to be more, aggra- be more, you know, but it really didn't fit his personality well. I thought he was very good in JCP. I thought he fit the role fine. No, but I, I, w- I thought he was very vanilla, especially after they brought in Jim Ross. I think when they brought in Jim Ross, it exposed a lot of Shirani's weaknesses. But, but vanilla is fine in that role because you had so much character in the mm-hmm. roster. Um, yeah, and plus, by the time Tony left, and by the time, like, Lance left, and a couple of other people left, like, Jim Ross was doing way too much, and you could tell it was wearing on him. So, okay, before we get too far into that, we should probably, you know, start getting into our regularly scheduled programming here. Yeah, there there is one thing I need to talk about. Stick to Wrestling for the next two weeks is going to be sponsored by Hot Box Cards, and this is a monthly sports card subscription service. It's baseball and football cards. All boxes contain three op- unopened packs, 50 bonus cards, three hits, which is memorabilia and or autograph cards, and they are offering a one-time product called the Hot Tag Wrestling Box. It contains everything in the regular box has, plus chances at autographed 8x10 photos, 1950s exhibit cards, and 1982 wrestling all-star packs. If you use the code WICKEDGOOD, all caps and all one word, you will receive an extra unopened pack in their hot tag wrestling box. The wrestling boxes are shipping starting August the 12th, which is right around the corner, which means football is right around the corner, which means that the quality of this broadcast is going, going to sink quickly. I'm just kidding. Maybe. And uh, you can go back a couple of weeks and when we kind of went through the boxes that they gave us. And the, it's not just one type of card. It's all different from all different eras. You had stuff from the 80s, from uh, today, from the, the 90s, some vintage cards. It, yeah. was, it was really a good collection. So a great way to support the show is to go see our friends over at Hotbox. No, definitely. And you know what? I'm not lying when I tell you I'm not like a card guy like I used to be when I was you know younger. But if I was a card guy, I'm serious. I would have really liked like this yeah they were fun all right we have now we're going back we are doing our summer series we're going to talk about summer related events as i hinted towards we're doing summer of 1989 again but this time we are doing the nwa i want to bring on um our guest a long time friend we're recording this on july 23rd 2019 30 years ago was the 1989 great american bash that's a long time, and I went with the gentleman I'm about to bring on. He's been our, our guest before, Mr. Randy Smith. Randy, thank you for coming on. Thank you for having me. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, we I, – I, I think a lot of it was because – 
in 88, we went to a convention and we made a lot of friends. I knew Randy on, from the phone before the October 88 convention, but we met a lot tape of guys. Trading, yeah. yeah, it wasn't just tape trading, though, you know, well, between you and me. I mean, you know, we would talk on the phone and stuff. And we yeah. met all these cool dudes with this common interest. We all got back together in February 89 to go to Philadelphia, and then here it is, summer of 1989, we're getting together, and we're going to the show in Philadelphia the night before, and then the Great American Bash on July 23rd, 1989, and it was an experience, but we'll get more into that um, as we go along. Sean, what are our topics for today? I mean, besides, besides NWA summer of 89. We have other well, I mean, we were going to kind of discuss the feuds from that from that little period, and of course, I can't see how we could avoid talking about one of the great pay per views of all time, the Great American Bash, the show that you guys were at. Which basically, I I you saw it live, and I was lucky enough to see it six months later on a, a beta tape uh, <laughs> on my couch. So most likely, I'll be asking more questions here because okay. this I mean that, this pay per view. It's one of the great pay-per-views of all time, not just the era. And just so you can, just so you guys can understand how crazy I was about the NWA product, and about you know just what a fan I was. I mean, I get home from this thing on Monday morning, you know, get home from the whole extravaganza, and Tuesday night I'm watching the pay, the pay-per-view that I just saw live on tape. It's okay. So let's go some, through some of the feuds of the era. So this is where we're talking about right now is right after the Steamboat Flare feud. Exactly, and we talked about the Clash of the Champions uh, that came before this. So we're we've moved on from that. Um, we had uh, Ric Flair has been out of action uh, since. Uh, the last pay-per-view, which took place in May, they teased, you know, they did the angle with Terry Funk where Ric Flair got piledrived on the table. They did a teaser where, you know, can Ric Flair come back? Is he going to retire? I think the densest mark in the world had to know that this was all a setup, that Ric Flair, yeah, was definitely coming back and was going to wrestle Terry Funk at the Great American Bash. But Flair has taken, God, like two and a half months off, which was well, unheard of for, for was him. Was it? Wasn't Reed born at this point? Uh, I thought that, that was the reason for the the layoff. Uh, it might have been, but I mean, I hate to say this, but Flair had other children that he didn't take time off for. He talked about that in his book. I think when he signed his new deal with um, Ted Turner in early 1989, I'm pretty sure he made it clear that he wanted to take some time off. He'd been on the road for 15 years, and he just wanted a little bit of a break. Um, I'd always heard it was because of his son, that his son being born. Uh, I mean, I mean, maybe, maybe it was a, maybe it wasn't a coincidence that this is the, was the time that he selected. There's also something to the Jeff Jarrett deal about the, to get somebody over, you have to get the main guy out. Um, I mean, yeah, I, I mean, Randy, I don't know what you think of this. I mean, I think Flair, by turning him as they did, they did as much as they needed to do to freshen him up. Any thoughts? Well, at that point, they couldn't really do much more than turn him, uh, yeah. in my opinion, anyway. I, they were at the point where they had to do that uh, one way or the other, and I think the way they did it with – uh, Terry Funk at the pay-per-view in May. I believe that was for the Russell War pay-per-view. Uh, it, it was. I thought they did it great. I mean, it, it couldn't have done a flare turn. Couldn't have been done any better than it was with Terry Funk. I completely agree on all of your points that Flair needed to be turned earlier. That the turn they actually did was so well done because Flair. In his feud with Ricky Steamboat in that series, I mean, you could, how could you come out of that with nothing but respect for Ric Flair? So he's already set the table, and then Terry Funk comes in and does what he did. And by the way, uh, both Luthez and Pat O'Connor, who were the two of the judges for that match, have come right out and said that they had no idea that the third judge, Terry Funk, was going to do with what he did. They kept them in the dark. Well, you know what? I mean, at, at the point... I. I didn't see it coming right away either. I mean, I, I thought, you know, when I saw the three of them out there as judges, it, it didn't hit me that they were going to run that angle until 
a little bit late, you know, after after they won the match, after Flair won the match, and you see Terry get up, and you kind of got the indication at that point, when you saw Terry go into the ring, you knew what was going to happen, but I had no idea how well they were going to play off each other. Because I, I couldn't, I mean, up until that point, I, I couldn't see Terry Flunk, Terry Funk and Ric Flair doing what they did together as well as they did it. I was wrong. I thought I, I did not even consider the idea that Terry w- could do what he did because, first of all, he'd been around in the NWA, you know, doing commentary. He, he did commentary for the Clash of the Champions in New Orleans. He'd been around doing, you know, he'd been on TV. And coming in, if someone said, hey, well, how, what do you think about doing Ric Flair and Terry Funk? I would have said Terry Funk was too old and Terry Funk would have proved me wrong because he got in the best shape of his life and yep. he just killed it in the ring, killed it on the mic. He was actually an un- not he wasn't a cool heel like one of the four horsemen. He was a real heel and people wanted to kill him. People hated Terry Funk. Oh no, he was like a Dennis Condry heel. Yeah, make no mistake. There was nothing cool about it. He was just a badass. Yeah. Um, but but one thing, the one tip off for of me for Terry was if you watch Terry in the, the 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 show leading up to this, I have never seen Terry so pleasant. Terry has his arm around everybody, at mm-hmm. least on TV. Terry has his arm around. He's smiling the whole time. He's the happiest man in the world. It's like okay, what's up? Okay, <laughs> Terry's just way too happy right now. Even when Terry's a baby face, he's not that happy. Very true. And I mean, he it it came kind of slowly, got in the ring. He congratulated Flair and then he kind of and I'd like to to challenge Ric Flair for the NWA title. And Flair tells him, you know, no, you haven't wrestled here. You've been in Hollywood. And then Terry says, oh, I, I guess I'm not good enough. And as soon as he said that, I was like, whoa, wait a minute. And then finally, you know, I was just kidding. And then he suckers Flair. It was great. Uh, say we have um, we've we've kind of talked about that few in the past. So uh, what we uh, we're kind of looking to do right now is kind of tell the year through uh, at least the summer through some of the feuds that went on. So as for, uh, Flair's gone, we have Terry and Sting. Yeah, and that was that was an excellent idea having Terry go around the horn against Sting in main events. Okay. Um, it was like a double main event, Terry Funk against Sting, and then the U.S. title match, Lex Luger defending against Ricky Steamboat. Now, you're, you're trying to build up Terry Funk as a major heel. So you put him in the ring with Sting, who is, you know, has already gone up to superstar status. And, yeah, you have, you know, St- uh, Funk, maybe not clean, go over Sting every night to help build him up to this pay-per-view. One problem, Sting won't do it. This and amazes me. Even back then, he was he was given uh, problems about Terry Funk. He was he wouldn't do he wouldn't do business with Funk, and he and it wasn't even just you know wouldn't do business because I don't want. It's like look, we've got this pay per view coming up. This guy just got here. He needs to get some big wins, and Sting wouldn't do it. Randy, do you remember this? I I remember it now that you're talking about it. Yeah, I do. Yep. Yeah, and, and that, that was a big a big thing at the time because I mean you gotta you gotta remember thirty years ago. I mean we we look at we look at Sting now for what he what he did and everything, but thirty years ago he was a new guy. I mean he he was hot and and people loved him and he, he was over big time, but he was still a new guy and for. For him to do that, I, I know a lot of us were kind of, you know, how how can you do that? How can you disrespect Terry Funk to the point where you do that? And I know a lot of people questioned that, too, when, when he did that. Yeah, I, I recall that. Yeah, I mean, he, you're you're disrespecting the company that's paying you what five thousand dollars a week or whatever it was. I mean, do business, and there's you know it, they're not doing. There's a big reason they want Terry Funk to go over. They need to sell him as a top challenger. I mean, yeah, you're right. He'd been in the business for four years, and this is Terry Funk you're talking about. Well, and this yeah, isn't. That, yeah, this like isn't. That, no, I was just saying this isn't Al Perez. Right. Exactly. Right. It, 
You know, I, I thought the whole thing was, I thought, I understand, look, wrestlers, they have to look out for themselves, but they can't be that selfish. That That's just off, off the, or, or, over the top to me. I mean, I know being a fan at that time, if that were me, uh, I would be honored to have done anything for Terry Funk. That, you know, that, that, that's how I look at it anyway. Yeah, and one thing too, we're we're moving ahead a little bit in time, but Ricky Steamboat, they couldn't come to an agreement with him, so they let him go. Steamboat did everything he was asked to do, and then some, and they couldn't figure out how to keep him happy, how to keep him on the payroll. Then, less than a year later, they had it all planned out where Terry Funk, his last match was going to be at the Clash of the Champions um, no, later that November in 1989. And then Terry was going to become a full-time commentator. And he didn't even last as a full-time commentator. And here's a guy who literally broke his back in that company, almost lost an arm because he, he kept uh, wrestling when he had an infection in his elbow. And, you know, they figure out a way to keep Sting happy, but not Funk and Steamboat. I don't, I don't want to make, I don't want to make it sound like I hate Sting either. Um, I just don't agree with what he did. He's not Funkin' Steamboat. No. I mean, no. I mean, not even not even in that league. And and because once you see those two start to get minimalized, what happens to the year? All of a sudden, uh, the smoking hot start they have of 1989 just screeches to a halt until you get that really lame Starcade. Um, I don't think it really screeched to a halt until they did the angle where um, in the, cl- the clash in, in February where Sting got injured and the horseman turned. That's when they that's when they messed up a really good thing. When Arn and Ole returned, maybe it was just a temporary thing, but the, the four horsemen with Sting, Flair and the Andersons were red hot and they messed that up. But anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. You know what the irony of Sting getting upset about the pinfalls is? In all these angles, he looks like an idiot. In all these yes. angles, he gets turned on. He gets – he looks like – Luga did it to him. I mean, yeah. you know, it's – everybody has – you know, he, everybody – he looks like a moron in all of these angles. But he, he wins though. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it, it doesn't make him. any sense. He he was you know he was still really hot. They considered him to be the future of the company, the next Hulk Hogan, and they're unfazed by his behavior. Summer of nineteen eighty nine, the unsung feud of the summer that just does not is not discussed among the great feuds. What Ricky Steamboat did with this guy this is this is where you're right, John. Where they did him wrong because what the matches he dragged out Alex Luger. In this stretch, were fantastic. These are some of Luger's best matches. Period. Oh, the, I mean, the, I believe, and oh, I, I, I've been waiting to talk about this. Randy, you were there, Philadelphia Civic Center, uh, yep. July twenty second, nineteen eighty nine. There is a match out there that is not on tape, as far as we know. And if it's on tape, I'll be shocked. Um, it was Ricky Steamboat against Lex Luger at the Philadelphia Civic Center, and. It was like enough people in the newsletter industry saw it. Uh, Meltzer saw it. I think Wade Keller was out there. I mean, there were a bunch of newsletter people, including Randy and I, that can vouch for this match's greatness. It was a five-star match. Randy, do you agree? I do. And it it kind of – I I was looking for that the next night at the pay-per-view, and they didn't get there. The the match they had in Philly – the night before was, in my opinion, two or three times better than what they had on the pay-per-view. Well, it made it so great. And what, well, let me just say this. What they did at the pay-per-view was a really good match. I mean, I would say it was like yeah. three and three quarter stars, but this match in Philadelphia was flawless. And, and to answer your question, Sean, I think a lot of it was the pacing. Like for whatever reason, these guys were going a million miles an hour. And Randy, tell me if you agree with this. Like, of course, he's Ricky Steamboat. He's going. He's going to get a great match out of whoever he needs to get a great match out of. But Luger, in my opinion, held up his end. Luger. Luger had something the night before in Philly that he did not have the following night in Baltimore. I I can't, I I don't know. I I can't even, 
you have to see if, if you could see both of them, you'd you'd get it. But I I can't. Luger just didn't. He didn't seem to be have what he had the night before in Philly, and I don't. But you're you're right. I mean that the match they had in Philly was incredible. I mean, yeah, terrific. And Could you know, be nerves. Uh, what's that? Could it have been nerves? I'm trying to think what the difference between the two nights would have been. Maybe, um, maybe Lex. I mean, this is a reach, but maybe Lex was more used to wrestling at night instead of in the afternoon, and he didn't have time to recover from the night before. I have no idea. I have no idea why. And they had, they, they had. Um, I saw two other Luger Steamboat matches. One in Boston, and I think, I think they wrestled in Springfield. And the, I know the one in Boston was really, really good as well. Um, not quite up to the Philly match. Match, but it was a really good match. Now, here's a sad thing. We've talked about this before. I went to see uh, you know, the NWA. I think it was July 7th or July 9th, 1989 in Boston. And Ricky Steamboat got booed out of the damn building. It was brutal. I don't think I've ever seen a baby face booed quite like that before uh tommy rich certainly got it bad in philadelphia at the halloween havoc 89 pay-per-view but i mean the the, everyone in boston just hated steamboat it's the white meat baby face i I think he went over the and we've talked about this before he went over the top with you know being nerdy with the wife and the kid well, yeah, well, yeah, it was Steamboat, certainly. Uh, I was more, you know, with the other guys. You, you will tend to have a problem if you're a white meat babyface coming up into these northeast cities. Um, Especially with NWA fans. Why did this not last long? Um, it didn't last long because Jim Hurd, and I, I, you know, I don't know if it's just Jim Hurd's fault. I don't want to like throw his name out there like Jim Hurd, but for whatever reason, the company couldn't come to an extension with Steamboat. I think his contract was ending, I want to say September 1st. I could be off by a month or so. And, you know, in the middle of July, the, the company decides that they can't come to an agreement with Steamboat. So they're sending him home. Which is crazy. Were they paying Paul Ellering more than Steamboat? They may have been, but Ellering was getting Ellering was getting a basically Ellering was siphoning money off of Hawk and Animal. So whatever they they came as a package, and they decided to divvy up the money however they wanted to. And who you know who cares? I can't I can't imagine why they were all, like just leaning toward the cliff. With, yeah, with money management like this. So they so they have everything perfectly set up for a Ricky Steamboat versus Lex Luger Texas Death Match. Luger keeps saying I won't do a Texas Death Match against him, and then they have the pay the pay per view finish where Luger gets DQ'd. So they they've got that perfectly set up, and they decide to part ways with Ricky Steamboat. Don't worry, no one's going to miss Ricky Steamboat because now we're feuding Lex Luger with the 1989 version of Tommy Rich Thud. I can't imagine. This is this is such a perfect microcosm for the, it, what was entirely wrong with this with this company from then up until the end, through the NWO to the end. They come up with these great ideas. They have great talent, and all of a sudden they go out of their way to screw it up. Okay, it's not just negligence. It's like we have to meddle and we yeah. have to get our fingers in there because it, it just because it's working perfectly now, we can make it work more perfectly. <laughs> and then by meddling with it, they screw the whole thing up. They do it all the time, and they do it here. Randy, what was your reaction to Ricky Steamboat out of the picture, and Tommy Rich is now the new number one contender for the NWA United States Heavyweight Championship? At, at the after, you know, it's funny we're talking about 1989. That that was the year for me that. Even though we were great, everything was great up until summertime. I remember, I remember the NWA going downhill in 1989, and that that's the perfect example right there of you know how can not the Tommy Rich Tommy Rich was not that good in 1989, but. Tommy Rich was a big name in 1981, but <laughs> they they tried replace. No, there there might have been there might have been between five and ten guys on the roster that would have worked out in that position better than Tommy Rich, but I don't know whose idea that was. But again, 
bad decision making there. I like Tom. When is the last time Tommy had a match of any significance before then? Would, would it have been uh, uh, the one of the matches? With, uh, I was going to say it, two years ago, two years earlier. And before then, I you mean, know, you're Tommy, going back to like 86. I mean, but I mean, it's this is not 81 Tommy Rich here. 81 Tommy Rich all set. It, what kind of delusion is this? Is this them just thinking they can get away with it? Uh, here's here's how I feel about 1989 Tommy Rich. There should have been a place on that roster for him. And I'm not even going to say, you know, as a jobber or anything like that. You know, he should have been there. I know he had some kind of an issue with Crockett and Dusty, which is why he never came in uh, when they, he, which is why he left after they took over. Um, but there should have been a place in an Atlanta based wrestling promotion for Tommy Rich, uh, just not that spot on the card. He should have been further down. Um, I don't know what else to say. It, it was just no one took him seriously as a, a, a challenger against Lex Luger. I'm amazed the pizza place stayed open this long. <laughs> I mean, honest to God, I mean, it, it, I don't know. It's it, wrestling. It's different. What, what are you watching? Okay. I mean, one guy deserves a lot of money and the other guy doesn't. Yeah. I just don't. I mean, I, I'm not a wrestler. I'm not a manager. You guys have way more experience in the business than I do. I could see this. It's just, it's even that as a cop out for them with these horrible contracts. No, I agree. And and you know what? Maybe I'm being a little bit unfair regarding the Ricky Steamboat situation because I, I don't know what the numbers were. Also, Tom Zank got unfairly blamed by the quote unquote smart fan community because a lot of people thought that the the money that they were going to spend on Ricky Steamboat was then spent on Tom Zank, which is not the case. That's just not how it works. Oh god. <laughs> Why, why do you have to pick topics that are going to aggravate me? I don't know, but I, I would have made a million dollars with Tom Zank. I'm telling you right now, I would have made a million dollars with that guy. Just make him be, let him be a heel and let him be himself, and you've got a million dollars, a million dollar guy. Oh, I agree with that. He absolutely, he's Gino Hernandez. He, like, that's the type of, he's not that good. But, I mean, that's the type of heel you'd be looking at as a Gino Hernandez type. Yeah, I mean, he was a great athlete, good-looking guy. He was, I mean, he was a funny guy outside the ring. He was just kind of not a baby face, you know, and you could tell that whole, you know, persona he had in WCW. Was, I mean, he was beyond phony. He, he came across that way to me. Have you any uh, memories of the Z-Man, Randy? Oh, yeah, quite a few. I, I think I would have liked to have seen him play as a heel, but I don't. In the long run, I don't know if that would have worked for Tom. I, 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 maybe because it never happened, I can't visualize it, but I see him more as a baby face than a heel. You know, you could have gave him a heel run to try out the waters with it, but I don't think it would have worked for him. My huh. opinion, but I, I don't know. Well, I, I will say this. Now, obviously, I... I even though we don't agree, I certainly respect your opinion. I, it, it didn't work as a baby face. I mean, the fans just didn't get into him. But, I mean, there is a point to be said about some people who just don't like getting booed. I mean, maybe. I, I have no reason to think that Zank would have had a huge, huge problem with that. Well, it's, just, it's, it's, it's not even like a problem. It's just some, some – most people don't like getting booed. Not everyone's – the Dennis Condries of the world are, you know, or Jim Cornette's are the rarities. You know, what most like to be liked. Uh, you know what? That's actually not true. A lot of guys uh, that I've known in the business love being a heel. They love having that persona. They love going out there and doing the things that heels do. When I say that, I mean like as as far as the overall population. It's not a natural thing to sit there and go, you know what? I'm going to get hated by everybody. There's yeah, more natural I, light. That's what I'm saying. It's an unusual characteristic. I'm not surprised he doesn't want to do it. Most people wouldn't, but I don't know. But he would be a good heel. I agree with you. Uh, so we have one cool addition here that they could never seem to know what to do with, which was uh, our next feud. It's Sting and Muda. Okay, yeah, let me talk about this. And this is very great American Bash specific. Um, everyone, everyone thought that Eddie Gilbert was turning. And I don't just mean like the quote unquote smart fans. I got to stop saying smart, quote unquote smart fans. Um when I was in that building on that afternoon, Randy, I don't know if you had the same vibe, but 
Sting came to the ring with Eddie Gilbert. Muda came with Gary Hart, and everyone around me was yelling, "Gilbert's turning!" I I recall that really, they had the match in Philly. That was it. Uh, what match was? There was a stipulation to the match. I don't. I think it might have been like a coal miner's glove match or something like that. It was like a kendo shy match or something like that. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, I, I agreed. I mean, I, I think that they kind of missed an opportunity with Eddie to turn him. Big Eddie time. was a natural heel. I mean, Eddie, no doubt about it, Eddie Gilbert was a natural heel. I mean, oh, absolutely. But I think it was a dragon shy match. Okay. That's, no, that was the thing right. that Gary always rolled out. He did it with Kabuki, too. So what I heard many moons ago, and I believe this, is that they absolutely were going to turn Eddie Gilbert on this show. And they did a taping in Atlanta, uh, I think the Tuesday before, I want to say, or maybe the weekend before. And they pulled the plug on it like that weekend. That And the reason they did it was because... Every, well, everyone knew that Eddie was going to turn, which I think – I mean you want there to be an element of surprise, but you don't, you don't just trash an angle because you think too many people know what's going to happen. I mean everyone knew Paul Orndorff was turning on Hulk Hogan three years earlier, um, and that, fe- that feud still drew record crowds. Now you've completely pulled the plug on Eddie Gilbert. He now has no role and nothing to do. And what a surprise he died on the vine. The best turn should be obvious. It just should be well concealed. And then when it happens, you go, Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. I see what happened here. Yeah. I mean, I, and like I said, you know, they had a role for, you know, bad guy, Eddie Gilbert. And it was the best role that he, you know, it was a role he was used to playing. It was a role that you could see he was good at. And now it's like he had no place in the promotion. It was crazy. Eddie Gilbert learned wrestling by watching heel Jerry Lawler. Mm-hmm. And you talk that's... about how he went through life impersonating Jerry Lawler. You want to see Eddie Gilbert in 1989? Go back and look at Jerry Lawler in 1978. Or 1975, because <laughs> it's basically you're, you're going to see a, it's kind of like a Dick Slater, Terry Funk kind of thing. Yeah, totally. And, yeah. you know, I mean, Eddie, Eddie, Eddie was someone who could be a good baby face after he had been a heel. Yet he came in as a baby face or he returned as a baby face in the fall of 88. Got a push, actually got some main events. Randy and I were at a show in Philly in February where it was Eddie Gilbert and Sting against uh, Ric Flair and Barry Windham. As much as a fan I was of Eddie Gilbert, I just didn't think he fit in as a main eventer. What do you think, Randy? I, he, he could uh... – I don't know. I think I'm, I'm a, I've always been a mark for Eddie Gilbert. I think because, you know, we knew him personally and yeah. I always thought Eddie could do you know, any role they would put Eddie in would, it would work for him. Even a main event role. Yeah. That would work for Eddie because I like Eddie. I'm no. Eddie's buddy. Looking back at it now, uh, no, I, I don't, I don't think I'm, I'm Eddie was a terrific performer, but did he have that main event potential that, that main event X factor that you have to have? No, he didn't size and, is a killer here. It, it yeah, is. I, and you took the words out of my mouth. I thought his, his best work by far was when when he was in Mid South Wrestling or by then UWF in 1986, and he was this little twerp you know, dressed up like he's on like he's a villain on Miami Vice, hiding behind Sting and Steiner and etc. This is the flag angle with Bill Watts, uh, right around that time. Yeah, that that same yeah. that same persona. And then even the year after, Eddie, when, when Eddie, not to get off topic, but when Eddie and Terry Taylor were heels from the UWF in, in 87, they were terrific together. I mean, they, they played so well off each other. And yeah, I, I loved Eddie back then. 
they were great and they made such a mistake not doing a U-turn and just putting the TV title on Terry Taylor at Starcade 87. It's like Terry just showcased everything he could do and you still just like, you know, went by the book and yeah, Nikita squashes him and Terry Taylor sucks. It was ridiculous. Yeah. And the and the secret word for this show is mistake. <laughs> um <laughs> So there's for, for the Groucho Marx fans out there. Um, so, uh, but so out of here we have Sting and the guy who really was when I saw him, and I didn't really watch a lot of Japan at this point. I wasn't exposed to it. When I saw this guy, I was like, "Wait, was this the first moonsault in America?" Great Muda. Um, I had, to, I think so. It had to have been. Yeah, you know what? When when Muda came in March of '89 is when Muda came in. Nobody had have seen anything like that up until the point. Like you know, you watch Muda matches now; they're nothing special. But back in 1989, when he came in, nobody had really seen anything like that before, let alone in the NWA. And Muda turned a lot of heads, and you know, even I, uh, you know. Uh, for me, anyway, he really kind of opened up a whole new world for me with the NWA when he came in. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know. I <laughs> they never seemed to know what to saw do before. They never seemed to know what to do with him. He was always kind of stuck in that upper mid card kind of, you know, that deal. Same with Rick uh, Scott Steiner at the time. You had these two amazing athletes just freakish. I mean, Scott Steiner was just crazy too, especially yeah. back then. It was you never saw anything. He was doing Muda stuff, except he was another what forty pounds bigger. Oh, at least. Yeah. I mean, here's the thing. I remember hearing that Kiji Muda was coming to uh, the NWA. They were bringing him in. They were going to give him uh, Gary Hart. Um, they were going to bill him as as Kabuki's son. And I was like, oh, crap, he's too small. I saw him as the white the ninja in Florida and then ninja whatever in world class. I'm like, this is not going to work. As soon as I saw him walk down the aisle for the first time, I was like, wait a minute, this this could work. And he does his squash match and, you know, he looks like a million bucks. I mean, by the by the time he was a month in, as soon as you know, you would see a jobber in the ring and then like his music would start playing and I would mark out just for the music. So, you know, so like, you know, I know what match was coming up next and it's like yes it's Muda I'm about to have a fun five minutes they were very much like oh go ahead I'm sorry Randy no it it wasn't even the moonsault I mean that that was the only time I never saw anybody do an elbow like Muda did just a regular driving elbow remember when he'd come off the rope and he'd do that little twitchy thing and just yes. drive his body. And I never saw anybody do an elbow drop, like a simple elbow drop. He made it something special. Yeah. And then he would do that handspring elbow that was just out of control, but you're yep. right. He had that, that, that like weird kind of herky jerky motion to him yep. that added a lot to his matches. Now, I don't know who came up with that. It seems like kind of a Gary Hardish thing. And if it, Gary Hart came up with that, good for him. There was a snap to the moves that he did that was the, the kind of it was, in, in a similar way that uh, Vader kind of jumped out at you because it was a pop to it when he hit you with these moves. It kind of just was jarring almost. Oh, absolutely. You know what? Before I'm, I'm a little bit out of order here, but Randy and I were at in Baltimore for the Great American Bash. They were talking about um, Terry Funk has a surprise. And they'd been talking about this for weeks, and the surprise turned out to be Gary Hart. And as soon as I saw Terry Funk with Gary Hart, I'm like, oh, God, you can't water down Terry Funk. He doesn't need a manager. And 15, 20 minutes, whatever it was later, when Muda came out, it immediately made sense to me because now Sting comes to Flair's rescue, which cements Ric Flair's babyface status. Uh, doing the whole thing where I don't say this a lot, pal, but thank you. And now you've got the Muda and Funk faction, which elevated Muda up against Flair and Sting. Now, Randy, I've talked about this probably too many times, but tell me if you agree. The the brawl that they had at the end of the Great American Bash with Muda. Highlight. What's that? That was the highlight of the whole show. That was the highlight of the whole show. And, and you know, I, I think you, you mentioned that Watching it on TV, it didn't it didn't truly capture what we saw being there live, 
It was but a tornado that's... live. TV did not yeah. do it justice. As soon as I saw that show on tape, uh, three days later, I'm like, this does not capture the magic of what was going on at the Baltimore Civic Center. It was like, it was a tornado of violence. It was awesome. That was wild. Yeah. And that, yeah. That, again, again, something like that you see every, you know, three times a week now. Back then, in at 1989, least. you did not see that. I mean, that that was something that it was special when something like that happened. And and the place was going nuts. Oh, yeah. Oh, it was it like, and once again, television nuclear just, heat. I mean, the nuclear heat, and I mean that that play. Everybody, everybody was on their feet, and uh, it was loud in there. And the people who had been wanting to cheer Ric Flair finally had the chance to do it. And yeah, not to be repetitive, but man, TV just did not capture that place going wild the way it was. The way it was. So, Sean, what do we got next? Now, now that I've gone completely out of order and screwed up the show. No, we're going to come back to that in a second. Okay, but real quick, we have one more feud I want to go over, and um, that's our Arcadian Vanguard buddy Jim Cornette, uh, the Papa Bear, versus Paulie Dangerously, which was just awesome, and they again messed it up. <laughs> <laughs> they can't help themselves. I think Paulie Dangerously in 1989 was one of the greatest managers of all time, and I mean that. I think he was that freaking good. He was amazing as a commentator. When he did the Sunday show with Lance Russell, he was as entertaining as a person could be. I am a huge and unapologetic fan of Paulie Dangerously. You're not going to get a disagreement here. You will not. Paul, I, I totally agree with you there. 88 and 89, um, Paulie Dangerously, he and Cornette were the highlight of watching TBS, whether they were commentating, whether they were getting interviewed, whether they were at ringside. Paulie and Jim Cornette were the reasons why I watched. Well, not, not that they were, they were the highlight of what I watched, put it that way. But as far as the tuxedo match at the bash, um, that was really bad, but it, it served it. I mean, it, it delivered what it was promised to be a tuxedo match. Paul Lee ended up getting stripped down to his underwear and ran away. I mean, they, they couldn't do much more with Cornet and Paul Lee in the ring than what they did at the pay-per-view. I am yeah, certain nobody was expecting a, uh, a uh, rock and roll express midnight express match coming out of that. I mean, so for what they were supposed to do, they did it. One thing about the, those two is the chemistry between them, John. And they had, because I remember a couple of years earlier, they tried to do something similar with uh, with uh, Corny and J.J. Dillon, but it didn't quite have the same feel. This, These two had a great chemistry right from the beginning. Yeah, and the funny thing is, you know, as, as alike in some ways as Cornette and Dangerously were, uh, I mean, they they just don't like each other. They never have. <laughs> and, I think, you know, I think that's just, why, it, yeah, it came off between the two of them. It came off so good between the two of them because they legitimately had heat for each other, I think. But that, know, sometimes that always doesn't get expressed on TV. No, it doesn't. Um, sometimes... I think someone will say, okay, I really hate this person, so I'm not going to, you know, I'm going to hold back a little bit. Like some of Jim Cornette's best lines were he were used on Baby Doll in 86, and those two didn't like each other. And Jimmy just, you know, went off. And I'm sure a lot of the Paul E stuff, you know, is similar in nature. But what I wanted to say was, Paul Lee, if you looked at the newsletter, uh, not, not the newsletter, the letter section of like the Observer or the Torch, there was a lot of like anti Paulie Dangerously stuff in there around this time. And you know, me and one, one of my friends were just like, you know what? This is These are frustrated Piper fans. This guy is better than Piper. He's similar to Piper, but he's not Piper, so they're going to take it out on him. But Paul was as you said there are some guys who are the cool heel and there are some guys who are the heel yeah and paulie's the heel and paulie's a guy who loves to get booed oh uh, yeah he is and you know what one other thing that i i disagree with a lot of people on summer of 89 paulie was managing the samoan swat team and paulie himself has said that he thought that was a bad fit I personally did not. I thought the three of them were great together. I thought they came across great on TV, but, you know, 
if if they're not happy, they're not happy. It was Captain. Well, the John, Lewis I don't moments. know. If you, I don't know if you remember, but uh, Paulie was legitimately afraid of the the Samoan SWAT team. Um, you know, they're the way they were outside the ring and everything. Um, oh yeah. I he he was legitimately afraid to be around them, and I I you know that that's a fact. Um, I thought they were good on TV. I mean I I don't know they if you if you compare his team before that uh, Dennis Condry and Randy Rose, and then you take the SST. I think Paulie looked better with the SST out there than he did with Condry and Rose. But it reminded me of the uh, Captain Lou and Samoans dynamic. No, I could see some of that. I remember they did a, a thing on Worldwide where the Samoan SWAT team, they were playing with flash paper, which is what Jerry U- Lawler used for fireballs. And they're out there pl- playing with this stuff. And Paul is like, don't play with fire. I've told you, don't play with fire. And it cracked me up. I don't know why, but I thought that was great. So let's go on. We have uh, one more few, then we'll get some memories from you guys uh, for the uh, the Great American Bash. But we have the Varsity Club and the Steiners, and Scott Steiners just came out of nowhere. Yeah, Scott had been wrestling, let me see, in 88, he had been wrestling for the WWA in Indianapolis, like Dick the Bruiser's old promotion, and then he went to Memphis as Scott Steiner, and then, I was it early 80, late 88 or early 89, he came in as Rick's little brother, Rick's younger brother, and he got out of that shadow pretty fast. Were they legit talking about Steiner for the World Championship? I don't know if they were at this point. I know I was. I I know I was looking at this guy and saying, you know what? In a year or so, this guy might be ready to to carry the NWA championship. That's how impressed I was with Scott Steiner, you know, that summer. Randy, what do you think? Yeah, I remember when he, uh, he did debut the first time we ever saw him in the NWA. It was actually an interview, uh, Chi Town Rumble, uh, when they okay. were interviewing Rick and Scott came on camera, and I think it was Bob Cottle. He actually, oh, who's that? You know, this is my little brother Scott, and yeah. But when he came on, uh, I mean, we had watched him in Memphis prior mm-hmm. to that, but a lot of people, a lot of people didn't see him or know what what he could do until he was in the NWA. Um, you know, we had seen him prior to that in Memphis, but. Yeah, I I think that they could have, if they would have played that right, I think that Scott would have definitely been a a world world title contender. Yeah, I now I remember that that skit at Chi Town. Thank you for reminding me. I mean, a lot of it too. I have heard that the Steiners were just happy being in in a tag team at the time. I know Watts wanted to turn him in. Uh, 1982 or was it early 83, 92, 93, excuse me. And Scott just didn't want to do it. They wound up uh, aborting the turn. So I don't know what happened, but you know, maybe that had a fact that had something to do with it that Scott just didn't want to do it. You know, you want to be world champion kid. Okay. This was, this was, so they were in there against the, uh, so Rick and Scott were in against the varsity club. And if memory serves, Scott got that crap kicked out of him in these early matches. Oh, yeah. Uh, Kevin played rough with him. And I want to say, you know, the varsity club was still around, I think, as the varsity club by this point. Rotunda was about to turn and they were about to give him that horrible gimmick where they used to call him Captain Mike because he was the captain of the varsity club. So they go out and they give it by him a wind blazer and a sailor's hat. And and that's the Captain Mike he was, I think, by the end of the summer of 89. The uh, the special word for this show is mistake. Uh, more like we don't know what we're doing. Oh uh, my god! Wow. So it's like, did they put ads in? We're looking for the most incompetent people possible. <laughs> they they must. I I just it's amazing how they do this. So now finally I get to talk about this. The pay per view, one of the great 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 pay per views of all time. Randy, Can I say something else really quick though? 
I want to get your guys, you guys' opinions on this. The Varsity Club, coming into 1989, they had – first, Steve Williams had become a member of the Varsity Club. Um, Steve mysteriously turned heel um, by pulling off a sweatshirt and revealing an Oklahoma singlet. Oh, my God, the, the humanity. And then in 89, they had another, like, non-turn, just him kind of coming back as a baby face for no reason, which, by the way, was not the way to use Steve Williams. And they replaced him with a guy named Dan Spivey, who was legitimately a defensive lineman for the Georgia Bulldogs. And you've got a, now you've got a completely fresh varsity club of, you know, Kevin, Mike Rotunda, and Dan Spivey. Was there someone else? Or am I forgetting someone? I think I think I'm I think I have Doc in there. That's why I'm thinking four guys. But anyway, wrestling is famous or known for at the time, just dragging something out until it's you know beyond dead. The varsity club is one of the few acts I thought broke up way, way too early. Randy, what do you think? They could have the, the way Rotunda and Steiner were, or, you know how it was. Every week they'd be out there shoving each other, and Sullivan would be hitting Steiner in the head. And uh-huh. they could have, they could have played that angle forever, and people would have loved it. I love that week after week. I loved it when they finally broke Rick away. I was bummed out. I did you know- not want to see that end. You know what? I personally thought they waited a little too long to turn Rick, but it all worked out. I mean, it's at some point you had to turn him, and they finally right. did. I want to say September 88, right around there. Yeah, you could tell by the way the roof blew off the place when they did turn him. One, the, I think you're right, John, that you could have kept that going as long as you had Mike and Kevin. And then you could have put somebody else in that third role. It, ideally, it's Rick. You won't, I don't think you'll have that level of success again, but you could have kept it going with those two and somebody else with some legit background. I think one problem, too, and I understand this, they put Dan Spivey in the Varsity Club, and then they brought in Sid, and they wanted to make Sid and Spivey the skyscrapers as the team that would challenge the Road Warriors. And so, that you know, basically, look, we like him in the Varsity Club, but we need him in another role. I, At the same time, I think they should have found another guy. Uh, what was the name of that guy who wrestled at Nebraska? He mo- he mostly had his career in Japan. Like if someone like that, you could have put in there. Uh, well, you I'll tell you it. If I could interrupt, ever, for thirty years now, I've thought, and a lot of people disagreed with me. Mm-hmm. I thought that the perfect member of the Varsity Club when Rick left would have been if they could have brought in Bob Backlund, and oh. and, and had him as a heel. Ooh. Bob You're Backlund right. in the Varsity Club, that would have, if they could have brought him into the NWA, talked him into turning heel, I, I kind of doubt he would have done it because of all the Kevin Sullivan devil worship and all that. But, you know, but if they could have got Bob Backlund in that role, I think Bob Backlund, Mike Rotunda, and Kevin Sullivan would have shined. Sold. Okay, I agree with you, but here's the problem. Number one, like you said, Bob may not have wanted to do it. Um, He did not want to wrestle as a heel. Um, I mean, he finally caved in in 94. He had that that title run. He had one more title run in him. True. Um, And also, Bob had kind of priced himself out of the wrestling business um, by this point. you know, like if you wanted to book Bob Backlund on an indie show, I, I don't know what the amount was, but supposedly it was an, an insane amount. And I, th- I think he was happy just being at home, not being on the road for a while. I'm going crazy trying to think of this guy who wrestled at Nebraska and had a, a pretty big career in Japan. <laughs> he, was a, he was an amateur wrestler at Nebraska, and I have his face in my head. But point being is you could have gotten a, a former football player, or, you know, anybody to play the role. I'm going to jump in. We only have a few minutes left. But I still want to get your, uh, since you were both there, your memories of uh, the Great American Bash in 89. Again, one of the great uh, pay-per-views I've ever seen. Randy, what do you remember about the show? What jumped out at you? Uh, what jumped out at uh, uh, Brian Pillman, actually, even though it was a prelim match with Bill Irwin, that, that was one of the first times. I think that might have been the first time I actually uh, 
saw Pillman live was that weekend. I think he was actually in Philly the night before, but uh, that was one thing. Um, I thought that the War Games match was really good, too. I mean, uh, we didn't even get to talk about that, but I think all five guys in the War Games match did great. Um, and if, if, if anybody's going to watch it, uh, there was a match in there with the skyscrapers against the dynamic dudes. At the end of the match, uh, Dan Spivey dropped John Laurinaitis on his head with a power bomb. That's worth watching for a little <laughs> bit of a little Easter egg in the show there. But yeah, John I was gonna, got dropped on his head. I was going to say the whole uh, uh, every match on the car is good except possibly that one. But the upside is the dudes got their asses kicked. <laughs> yeah, they did. They did. One quick um, skyscrapers thing. They had been going around the horn against Johnny and Davey Rich, the party patrol, ladies and gentlemen. I want to have patrol parties with those dudes. And they did in every match they had. Um, Sid would whip Johnny, not Johnny Rich, Davey Rich into the ropes and clothesline him. And Davey Rich would do this insane, like a 480 degree flip where he just like went flying in the air and, and did this somersault. And it was amazing. And it popped the crowd every time. And Sid would like get on one knee, put his hands up like he's the one that did something. And the fans reacted like he was the one that did something. He just sucked it in. It was it was too much. They had a match the night before in Philly. It was, it was Sid and Dan against uh, Johnny and Davey Rich. And they did that spot. That's right. Yep. Yeah, they did. Yep. So I got to see that three times at Boston, Springfield, and Philly. My number one memory for going from going to the bash in, in 89 live was me and the person we went with had really bad obstructed seats. And I, I don't know how this happened, but like there was this beam like sitting in my lap. So me being me, I get up and I go over to the box office. I'm like, hey, you know, I can't see a thing from where I'm sitting. There's a thing in my, my way. Oh, here's two other seats. I did not know that buildings would reserve extra seats, good seats for situations just like this. So I got really good seats just by being me and complaining about stuff. Oh, there's an uncomfortable silence. Who else was on yeah, my what... <laughs> Sean? Who else was on my list of like guys? We can talk about one more guy. Like who? Who? Who do you well, pick no, from that list? Wait a minute. I want to. I, I want to. What was the arena like for this event? I mean, what? How? What was it? I mean, was it a completely crazy crowd? Where were you guys sitting? I was sitting. Um. You, okay. The the building is shaped like an oval, and I was sitting like. In the good, like raised seats where the oval, like first starts going up. I'm living through you guys right now. I'm living vicariously through you guys. <laughs> okay, I, I was about the. I think I might have been uh, in the bash. I was the eighth or ninth row, and oh. it, it was pretty good. But everybody, they they were up and and jumping around, and uh, the, it was a hot crowd. And when you have a hot crowd, you you have people standing up in front of you, and you kind of have an obstructed view, and you have to stand up. And uh, the person and, the person behind you always thinks you're the problem, and that you need to sit down. Right. Yeah, I, I but, avoid floor seats at wrestling matches, ladies and gentlemen. Did we ever have any near riots in the crowd or anything, or was it mostly tame? As it far was as mostly Philly tame. Does. In, in Philly, yeah. Not, uh, I don't recall any. In, I've been in Baltimore two or three times. I never, never had any problem in Baltimore, but there was usually always a guaranteed fight or three or four of them every time they had matches in Philly. Oh, yeah. I am a strong believer that somewhere, and I mean this, between Philly and Baltimore, there's a line where people stop being assholes. There's like was Philly this? North, New York, Philly, Boston, we're assholes. Like Baltimore, people are nice. Um, Very quickly, I went to a Baltimore Orioles game in 1988 when they were like the worst team in baseball. This was like August. And the people were cheering Eddie Murray and Fred Lynn. They would have been booed out of Fenway Park. They would have been booed out of well, Veterans Stadium in Philly. It's, and I, was, I was just stunned to see this reaction. One last quick question. Uh, we have time for one last thing about the bash. What was uh, the biggest surprise uh, of the for your, uh, each one of you? John first. 
uh, the biggest surprise was definitely Gary Hart emerging from the dressing room next to Terry Funk. I did not know about that. Um, but like I said, we talked about that. The other biggest surprise was, and we talked about this, Eddie Gilbert did not turn. I was sitting there like waiting for something to happen as he and Sting walked back to the dressing room. I'm like, wait a minute, this can't be happening. And it did. Randy, what about you? For me, it was the, the mood and funk, the flare sting, the brawl after the match. Uh, that was a, a surprise to me. I, I didn't expect that. I never thought I would see anything like that live. It, it was well, well done. I loved it. I absolutely loved it. And once again, this has been the fastest hour of the week for me. Randy, I want to thank you for taking the time and coming on. You're a great guest, man. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank Sean. You, John. Thank you for all you do for this show. Um, and I want to thank our producer, Luke Hippelman, for all the great work he does. We will see you next week. And this has been a production of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network.